Let us pray. Dear gracious God, we give thanks for the opportunity to worship you this morning. And as always, as we come together for worship, we just pause for a few moments to once again turn our lives over to you, to um, bring before you the sins of our life, seeking your mercy and your forgiveness, your grace upon us. We pray, Lord, that as we turn from the ways of sin, you will turn us to the ways of righteousness, that we may walk the path that you have laid for us. We pray, Lord, that as we open up the scriptures this morning, you will open up our minds, that we may hear your word to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And our gospel lesson is from the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verses 12 through 15. Jesus is talking with his disciples, and he says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Amen. Well, someone compiled a list of kids' instructions on life. Some insightful instructions, some, some advice, some words of wisdom. So Rocky, age nine, says, wear a hat when feeding seagulls. That's, that's good advice, isn't it? Lamar, age 10, don't flush the toilet when your dad's in the shower. It's good advice. Carol, age nine, never ask for anything that costs more than $5 when your parents are doing taxes. Michael, age 14, says, never tell your mom her diet's not working. Joel, age 12, don't pick on your sister when she's holding a baseball bat. And finally, Laura, age 13, said, never try to baptize a cat. Some pretty good advice. Some pretty good advice. You know, I think we all need advice at times in life. In John 16, Jesus is trying to give his disciples some advice for the future. Jesus is preparing to leave his disciples. And so he says to them, Oh, there is so much more I want to tell you. There's so much more advice I need to share with you. And he tells them about the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will be coming upon them to guide them, to advise them. He then mentions the Father, the God, the Father God, and that all that is God's is Jesus. In these four verses, we have mention of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. You know, each year on the first Sunday after Pentecost, last week we celebrated Pentecost Sunday, each year on the Sunday after Pentecost, churches all over the world celebrate what is called Trinity Sunday. It's actually been done since the 10th, since the 10th century. It's a time to celebrate this, this precious doctrine of our faith, that God is one in three persons. You know, the Trinity is one of the most often used descriptions of God in the Christian worship around the world. We hear it in our hymns, we hear it in our praise songs, we hear it in our creeds. If you've been here on Communion Sunday, we say the Apostles' Creed, and it talks about, I believe in God, the Father Almighty. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. In Matthew 28, Jesus tells us to go into all the world and, and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Every baptism we do, and most churches do, it's in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. On any given Sunday, millions upon millions of church services end with a benediction, giving God's blessing to the people in the name of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the, the Creator, the Redeemer, the Sustainer. Actually, Pastor James Hazelwood of Brooklyn, New York, reflects on a sermon he preached on Trinity Sunday. He writes, A couple years ago, I thought I did a rather fine job of explaining the Trinity, 
And after worship, a woman in the congregation walked up to me and said, Pastor, I've been listening to preachers talk about the Trinity for nearly 70 years. Then she paused. And Pastor Hazelwood said he thought she was going to say something like, what a really great job he did in explaining it finally. But she continued, and she said, she has never met a pastor that has ever been able to explain the Trinity. And then she said, you know what I think? I think that pastors don't understand it either. You know, and maybe she's right. Maybe pastors, theologians, scholars, professors don't adequately understand the doctrine of the Trinity either. And you know, I think that's all right. Why shouldn't there be mysteries too grand for our little brains to comprehend? So, so let's be clear. In talking about the Trinity, we, we're not trying to explain God. We're only trying to explain in, in a very elemental way what God has revealed to us about himself. You know, as they say, to describe the tip of the iceberg above the water is not to describe the entire iceberg. So we're just looking at the tip of the iceberg of what God has revealed to us. So we Christians affirm the Trinity not as an explanation of God, but simply as a way of describing what we know about God. And while we really can't explain how it works, I, I think we, we can gain insight, we can gain understanding, maybe even glean some advice for our lives today by knowing that we believe in one God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So what do we know? Well, most of the world's people believe in a creator God. In fact, to most of us, the idea of this universe coming into being without a supreme intelligence guiding it is almost ridiculous. Think of the majesty of the mountains, the trees, the skies, the, the complex systems of our bodies, just life itself. We believe that God, as the creator, creates everything and continues to watch over, protect, and guide all creation. But such a God, such an such a all-powerful God, such a sovereign God, is remote, is un, un, unknowable. How can we possibly relate to a God, a creator God? And so God became one of us. God so desperately wanted a relationship with, with us, his creation, that he came down to us in the life of Jesus of Nazareth. In the Son, Jesus, God shows us the length and breadth of his love for us. God, realizing the, the desperate situation we were in from our sinful lives, took our sins upon himself through Jesus Christ so that we might be saved and he might have a relationship and, and, and we might love him. See, when we speak of God, we are speaking of a creative power behind our universe as our Savior, but we're also speaking of a loving person who has entered our universe to save us. And we are speaking, we are speaking of a divine presence in our lives today. Jesus promised that he would not leave us alone. In John 14, Jesus tells us he will not leave us alone. He, he will not leave us helpless. He will send us a counselor, a helper, a friend, the Holy Spirit to guide us, to give us advice, to prompt us, to speak to us, to show us how to live life abundant here and now. As we talked about last week on Pentecost Sunday, the Holy Spirit brings power to our lives. So the Trinity is simply the Christian's way of talking about the one true God. God as creative power, God as our Savior, and God as an empowering presence to guide us in our lives today. You know, when I was thinking about this this past week, and I was thinking about Trinity Sunday, I was wondering what, what unchurched people would think of Trinity Sunday. You know, people that don't go to church. I, I was thinking of the people right across, you got to figure out where I am here, Spring Creek Road and that housing development over there. 
people that are not in church today. Maybe they're home reading the paper, or maybe they're still sleeping. Maybe they've never been to a church. What would they think if they knew we were celebrating Trinity Sunday? I think they might say, there they go again. <laughs> Talking about churchy things, not relevant to my life. You know, 50 years ago, they said that the, the ultimate question for people was, what is truth? But that's no longer true. Today, the ultimate question for people is, what's the point? What's the point of staying married if you think you don't love each other anymore? What's the point of working until you drop if the company is just going to downsize you out of a job? What's the, what's the point of getting a college degree if you aren't going to be able to find a job when you graduate? What's the point of, of eating healthy when science keeps changing its mind on what is healthy? I'm still looking for that healthy diet donut, but I haven't seen it yet. And that really is what people are asking, isn't it? I don't find very many people wondering on a daily basis or even at all, ever, what is meant by God, three in one, the Trinity. What people want to know is, how can I make it through this day and keep my dignity intact? How can I cope with the stresses of my life? How can I get, get it all together in a world that seems to be coming apart? How can I resist the latest temptation of pornography or cheating or, or drugs? And you know what? There is an answer to all these questions. And I think it does lie in the Trinity. Everything we need to know about life, we can discover right there. For in the Trinity, we discover just how much we are loved. And if we can grasp that, if we can grasp how much we are loved, and we really believe it, it can change everything. You see, if Christianity were simply a religion of keeping the law, the inner life of the lawgiver would not matter. But if Christianity is about a personal relationship with God, then who God is really matters. We discover that, that God is the creator, God is in charge, and we're not. That's sometimes hard for some of us. God is in charge, and we're not. God is the creator who wants a relationship with us. He is constantly pursuing us. The entire Old Testament is the story after story after story of God pursuing us. God wanting, to, wanting us to accept the love that he has shown to us. You know, people who do not believe in a creator God are faced with a great temptation to be their own God. They, they never experience the freedom of knowing that there is a God in charge wanting to love them. See, in the Trinity, we discover that Jesus Christ gives us our manual for living. In his teachings, he shows us how to live and how to live life abundantly and how we are to love each other and in loving each other, we find purpose in this life. And in Jesus Christ, we see God's ultimate love for us and that our sins are forgiven and we're promised new life. See, not just abundant life here on earth, a purpose for our living today, but, but new life, eternal life, life in heaven. In the Trinity, we discover that it is the Holy Spirit that guides us and directs us in this life, that guides us and shows us and helps us to love other people. It's the Holy Spirit that comes to us through, through those divine moments, such as the sacraments or reading the Bible or, or in community with each other or during worship. And it is the Holy Spirit that offers us peace and power each day. We discover that it is the Holy Spirit that, that sometimes pushes us, perhaps in directions we would not normally go, a direction that, that may be difficult but, but ultimately fulfilling. The answer to life does lie in the Trinity. It's the truth and it's the point. I think within the mystery of the Trinity, it all comes down to discovering how much we are loved. 
And when we discover how much we are loved, it should change us. And we should be challenged to love others. When there is this great God of the universe that wants a relationship with us, sends his son Jesus Christ to save us, and the Holy Spirit to empower us, it should change us and how we feel about ourselves and how we treat other people. I want to share with you a, a story about a little girl who discovered a great secret from her grandparents. It's a little bit of a hokey story, but it's a good story. It's a true story. Ever since this little girl could remember, her grandparents played this little secret game. They would leave the word smiley around the house for one another. Grandfather would stuff little notes with the word smiley in grandmother's sock drawer. Grandmother would trace the word smiley in the steam on the bathroom window so grandfather would see it when he took his morning shower. And over the years, they, they actually competed to see who could find the most creative way to leave a smiley note for each other. And when grandmother lost her 10-year fight against cancer, her casket was wreathed with, a, wreathed with a huge bouquet of flowers, and on the yellow ribbon around the bouquet was the one word, smiley. The thing that held her grandparents together, the thing that nourished them in life and sustained them in death, was smiley. S-H-M-I-L-Y. See how much I love you. And that's the message that should sustain us as well. It is the caption that the believer should see when we think of the Trinity. See how much I love you. You know, as a pastor, I, I long to, to talk with people and answer people's questions about life and about death and about God and to, to, to stand along beside a graveside and with a grieving family and, and think of what do you say to comfort them or, or to lead a group of confirmands and to talk to them about the Trinity or, or just faith in general. Sometimes I lay awake at night struggling with my own questions about life. And you know, what I have found is that there are questions that you just cannot answer. You cannot understand. Sometimes all you can do is take someone to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Take them to the Trinity. And tell them that everything you need to know about life is right there. And just see how much God loves you. Let us pray.